kind of stuff organized here. Oh, did I lose it? <laughs> yep, there it is. That's not a very auspicious beginning. <laughs> I know that. So I just wanted to say a huge thanks to Pastor Ryan and to all of you for uh, making your, your uh, speaking time available to so many of us. It means a great deal to me and, and my wife to be able to do this. I loved what I did and I had to retire early and so this is just a complete privilege for me to be here today. So let's uh, begin with prayer. Father, I just uh, thank you for this day, and I thank you for everyone gathered, for those watching online, for those uh, watching later when they see it on uh, Vimeo, Lord. And I just, uh, once again, I pray that you would fill me and everyone here and everyone watching and those yet to watch with an extraordinary and great measure of your spirit, Lord. You know that I'm very tired today. And Father, I can't do this without you. And so, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come, that you would give me wisdom, words, that you would guide my thoughts. You would bring me to say everything you desired me to and keep me from saying the things I don't need to. And Father, for everyone here, I pray that you would give us open ears to hear your word, open eyes to see a good view of, of our God and open hearts to receive the word that you have for us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, I was born to covenant missionaries in Japan. Let me see if I can get the screen up there. Yeah, there we go. I guess both bulbs are out. <laughs> okay, one more. There we go. So my parents were covenant missionaries to Japan, so I lived in Japan until I was 11. And my parents were both extroverts, but they were quite different people. My dad, uh, everyone knew him as the most loving man. He was a pastor and, and a missionary. Uh, that was outside the home. Inside the home, he could be the most loving father, most nurturing father, but he was a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. He had this switch in him, and when it would switch, he would snap, and he would go into a complete rage out of control rage, man of wrath. And he would physically abuse us as children. Um, he never touched my mom, but um, I love my father and I've long since forgiven him. But um, so that was my dad on the one side. My mother, mama, I call her. She's my birth mother. I've been blessed with two moms. Mama was a woman of pure compassion. She always took the side of pain uh, unless it was unwise to do so. But I remember being a little boy, I have a ptosis, a sleepy eyelid. So I, uh, in, when I was six years old, they did a surgery down at the hospital in Portland. And I had the surgery and I was, they kept me for three days for an eye surgery. That's what they did back then. But um, in the room next door to me with an adjoining door between our rooms was a little boy, probably four or five years old who had been severely burned. And he screamed and screamed and screamed. And his parents couldn't take it, so they left him to the nurse's care. Well, my mom had been a nurse, a psych nurse, and she was so moved by this little boy's pain that she went over and sat with him for three days in his pain. That was mama. So I had these two very, very different parents, and mama would, would protect us from our dad. You know, she'd get in between us sometimes. And, and uh, so when I was 12 years old, mama got cancer. And over the next three years, I watched Mama succumb to cancer. And she passed uh, just about two months after my 15th birthday. And during that time, I, I was paralyzed by grief. My dad was trying to pastor a church in Tacoma. My uh, brother had moved out, was in graduate school. My sister was at home, but she, like myself, was paralyzed with grief. All during those years of my mother's passing, my father would tell me, you're a good-for-nothing, worthless, lazy son. You're a good-for-nothing, worthless, lazy son. And he'd also tell me, 
I can tell you what kind of Christian you are, Grant, by how much time you spend reading the Bible and how much time you spend praying. I don't see you doing these things. You're not much of a Christian. And the more he told me that, the more I failed at the very thing he was trying to get me to do. So, when my mother died after that, I threw myself into the church, joined the choir, became the librarian for the church, volunteered for nursery. I volunteered at school for all kinds of things. I was treasurer of every club on campus just about. Um, and I was reading my Bible as much as I could, praying as much as I could. And I went to an early morning Bible study once a week with, with one of our high school teachers who was the, uh, Mr. Whalen, who, who led the um, Young Life group. And no matter how much I tried, and the harder I tried, the more I strived, the worse it got. And the more I failed, and the more I struggled with my sin and, and these desires that young men have, if, if you get my drift, I was miserable. Well, since then, I've, I've come to learn that I, I was believing a lie. I was, I was fed a lie, and I'm afraid it's a lie that we all share. It's not just my lie, it's the world's lie. And we've believed this lie since the fall. And it's a pernicious lie, it's a tenacious lie. It hangs in there. And it's so hard to see because it's so much a part of how we think that it's hard to unearth it. And as soon as we discover it, we think, now I have to unearth it. And that's part of the lie. So we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. And I'm not going to take a, long, a lot of time to uh, develop the first verses. Um, it's really verse 25 that I want to focus on. But anytime I read a verse, I like to read it in context. In Romans, it's also almost impossible to do that because Romans is one argument from chapter 1 through the therefore at chapter 12, and then the, the conclusion, therefore, goes on to chapter 14 or 15. So anywhere you jump in, you're going to be taking things out of context. Well, I worked my way all, all the way through Romans. I know the argument very well. Uh, it, I could always know it better, but uh, it's good to have the Lord instructing us. So reading from Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Against all ungodliness. Ungodliness literally means to live as though God doesn't exist. Against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men and women who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So this truth that Paul is talking about, every human being on the planet knows the truth, but we suppress it. We push it down. We bury it. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. So somewhere deep within us, every human being on the planet has a knowledge that God exists, that he's there. But we suppress that truth. And I think we can suppress it long enough until we can't hear it anymore. Moving on to 20 and 21. For since the creation of the world is invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so they are without excuse. So in the first verses we saw that God has put this eternal witness, this internal witness within us, this intrinsic, inborn witness within us. He's also put out an external witness to his being God, and it's in creation. And I think at no other time as in our generation do we have, we have such extensive scientific knowledge now. For instance, DNA. What an amazing thing your DNA is. If you were to read one character of your DNA per second, you know how many years it would take to read your, the, the book of who you are, the, the plan of who you are? It would take 96 years to read the master plan of who you are. And that master plan is in every cell of your body. Trillions of cells in your body. That master plan is replicated over and over again. Wow. We serve an incredible God. 
For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. They became futile in their speculations. Literally, it's in their reasonings. So much of the world thinks that they have a reasoned understanding of the world. But in their reasoning, in rejecting God, it's not reason, reasonable at all. And then it says, and their foolish heart was darkened. We always think of heart as our emotions. Hebrew people did not think of heart as, as their emotions. We have this head-heart divide. Hebrew people didn't think that way. They thought the heart was the seat of your uh, thoughts, of your mind. And that would include the emotions. They didn't... They didn't divide things up so much. So they, they thought of it as your inner being. Have you ever thought about who's listening to your thoughts right now? Well, that's your inner being, right? So that's their hearts. And their hearts were darkened. Hmm. Our hearts have been darkened. Verses 22 and 23, pro professing to be wise, they became fuel, f fools, and exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And that's speaking of the entire planet from the dawn of creation until the present. And exchange the glory of the incorruptible God. This word incorruptible can go two ways. It can mean that God is morally incorruptible. He's always just. He never can tell a lie. He always does the right thing. He never sins. He's incorruptible, without corruption, and he can't be corrupted. But it also can mean, our, uh, in the sense of a being, my body is getting corrupted right now, faster than I would like, with all these maladies I have. God can never be corrupted because in his own being, he holds life in himself. So he can never be corrupted. His being can never be corrupted. He will never know decay. And exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man or mankind, humankind, and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. So we exchanged the glory of this incorruptible God for idolatry. I grew up in Japan and there was idols everywhere, literally everywhere. It's one of the most idolatrous nations in the world. And I think that's why it's so hard for so many Japanese to come to faith because they've been blinded by the enemy with all this idolatry. But are we nonetheless uh, uh, idolaters in our society? When my wife and I were in Japan, we were thinking in our living room where to put the TV and there's this place where they normally put the Buddhist altar. We thought, well, the TV would go nicely there. <laughs> and then we thought, no, nah, nah, that's not a good idea. Let's not put it there. <laughs> but in our society, we worship self. And you hear it when our girls were growing up in, in school. We, we'd watch movies with them and, you know, and, and these teen movies, they, repeated ad nauseum. Just believe in your self. And what are we actually to do? Believe in God, in Jesus. And so if I brought out my phone, I, I won't do it, but I, I have an Oxford English Dictionary on my phone. And if I start it up and I just type in the word self, I counted the words that begin with self, the, these compound words. We have over 400 in our society like self-dependent, self-fulfilled, self-reliant, self-sustained, self-determined. And, and so we're well familiar with idolatry in our culture. Then on to Romans 24 and 25. Therefore God gave them over to, in the lusts of their heart to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. Right after this pop passage is, is the whole discussion of same-sex, uh, that, that whole discussion. I'm not going there today. But know that at the very end of the chapter, there's a whole list of other sins 
that God had, has given us over to, handed us over to, and it's not that God is responsible for our sin, it's that he's handed us over because why? Because we exchanged worshiping him for worshiping creatures, for worship, worshiping self, human beings. And then it continues in verse 25, for the exchange the truth of God for a lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. And there you see it right there, and worshiped and served the creature. So when it says, for the exchange of truth of God for a, a lie, it doesn't say just a lie, but it says the lie. You see that up there? A couple more here. And then one more. There we go. The truth of God for the lie. And they exchanged the truth of God. So it wasn't just the truth about God, but it's the truth of who God is in his essential being. And what do we know about God? God is love, right? And so they exchange this truth that God is love for the lie. And what is the lie? Well, if we go to the next screen, it tells us what the lie is. And they worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. You see that? So literally that verse says the lie. And I, some of your margins will have it in, in your notes. will have that it says literally the lie. Um, we have stylistic concerns that we let enter in into our translations. They're not that big a deal, but sometimes I think we... Uh, push it too far. So, And this is true of every, every generation, of every human being on the planet. We're born into this. Uh, I don't know how it comes to us, but we believe this lie that it's up to us, right? Worship of self. Living a self-determined life. A self-sustained life. And those are like American themes, right? I mean, you, you hear that and you go, what's wrong with you, Grant? What are you saying? Well, if we go back, you can hear the allusion in this to Romans chapter, I mean, Genesis chapter 3. So we'll get up the next screen. There we go. So if we go to, I have Genesis on the right, and Romans, I'm keeping that up there to remind you what we're talking about, to remind myself. But Genesis 3, 1 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field. And so if you go to the next screen, Revelation 12, 9 tells us who the serpent was. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. How much of the world does he deceive? The whole world. And so that included us as well. And to some extent, God's job in my life and in your life is to unpack the deception that we've believed. Do you follow that? So, to the next screen, Genesis 3, 1, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field with which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Well, to see what God actually said, you have to jump down to Genesis, back to Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And so we read the Lord God. Yep, the Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely. So he said, you can eat any tree, just not the one. And Satan reverses it completely in his question. Indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. So in the very question, he implants a lie. And he's getting... Eve to doubt what God said. And it's always his first line of attack on us. He gets us to doubt what God has said. I love the, the question we have in the covenant. Where is it written? And it's, it's uh, the question that goes along with it. How is your walk in the spirit? I've added in the spirit. But where is it written? In these days, we're turning it into, did God really say? Right? Moving to verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, 
But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. So for Eve, she didn't know the name of the tree necessarily, but she didn't call it by the name of the tree, the knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She just knew it by its location that it was found in the center of the garden. But notice what she says. God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. And what did God really say? But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Does he say anything about touching it? So that's another tendency we have as human beings is God gives us to do something. And okay, we're going to do that or not do that. But then we're going to add on our own safety valve, our own safety rules to make sure we don't even get close to eating the fruit. I'm not going to even touch it. And that's what the Pharisees were doing with all their fence laws, right? And we can do that with all of our church laws. All these rules we create to surround us so that we are protected from doing anything wrong. Moving on to verse 4 and 5, the serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. And what does it say? For in the day that you will eat from it, God has said, For in the day that you will eat from it, you will surely die. And Satan says, you surely will not die. So that's, that's his first bold-faced lie. It's not even a question now. He just outright lies to Eve. And then he adds, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And there's the lie of lies. There's the lie that we exchange the truth of God for the lie. Because the human race was tempted into being like God, right? We became gods unto ourselves. And ironically, that's the same temptation that Satan fell to in the beginning when he aspired to the throne of God. He wanted to become like God. He wanted to become God. So he tempts human beings with the same temptation that he has fallen to. For they exchange the truth of God for the lie. They exchange the truth of God, this God who had given them a garden to cultivate, this dignity of work, uh, these wonderful companions, animals to name and to care for, the ground to cultivate, and so on and so on. And they exchange all of that for self-dependence, self-determination, self, self, a self-sustained life. Were their eyes opened? Well, their eyes were opened to evil. And by knowing evil, they know the good. I know the good because I've lived such an evil life. Like Paul in Romans 7, I do the very thing I don't, do not want to do. I know the good, but I can't do it. Oh, wretched man that I am. Do you follow me? We know the good because we're stuck in the evil. And that's true of every one of you, however good of life you've lived. Uh, we're evil to the core. Moving on to verses 6 and 7. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was de desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. She gave also some to her husband with her, and he ate. So all this time, Adam was standing right there. We men like to blame women, right? Blame Eve. It was Eve's fault. It's our wife's fault. Don't go there. Not a good place to go unless you like sleeping on the driveway. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, my wife is very gracious. She would never do that to me. But he was right there and he didn't say anything. He just took an aid. So it's not Eve holds the only culpability in this. They both hold equal culpability. They didn't stop each other from eating. And their eyes were opened. 
Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Suddenly they became aware of them self, and they could no longer see beyond the horizon of themselves. And what did they lose sight of? God. They lost, they lost sight of who God is. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Mark Meredith covered this so well in his sermon right before uh, Easter, so I'm not going to repeat what he said. It was an excellent sermon. I listened to it on Friday again. Verses 8 through 10, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. It would seem that this isn't just a one-time thing. It's an ongoing event that happened probably every day. He came walking in the cool of the evening. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, God among the trees of the garden. They had never hidden themselves before, but now they're aware of themselves. They're aware of their nakedness. They're aware of their shame, as Mark so wonderfully brought out to us, that they start hiding ourselves. And we've been hiding ourselves ever since. And the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Where are you? A question that has been echoing down through the ages. A question that echoes to us. Where are you? And Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid. What's happened to his vision of God? What has happened to his knowledge of God? You know this, they exchange the truth of God for the lie. They knew God. And that word in the Hebrew of the knowledge of good and evil, that word is yada, which is used of, and Adam yada to Eve, and she conceived. So it's not just a head knowledge, it's an experiential knowledge. And there's all kinds of uh, in, uh, meanings to it, but it, it generally means an intimate, intimate experiential knowledge. So Adam and Eve exchanged their intimate experiential knowledge of God for a vision of themselves as God. And they couldn't see beyond the horizon of their own self anymore. So you think about our society and what we've done. That lie is prevalent in our culture. It's, it's wormed its way into everything. And it gets, it, it gets into our churches as well and into our faith. Because it's always down to what must I do? And we make God really small and we make ourselves really big. And it's always what must I do? And so... We thought we could have a righteousness of our own. We thought we could have a righteousness of our own making that we could produce. We thought we could generate peace and joy. We thought we could generate an ability to love other people. Hmm. If you go over to John 15, 5, it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. So Jesus' own words gets this, what happened to Adam and Eve in this verse. I am the vine, you are the branches. What had happened to Adam and Eve? They had seven, severed their branches from the vine and said, we're going to be life unto ourselves now. We're going to be living as gods unto ourselves. We're going to be the source of life. We'll be the source of a righteousness which is accept, acceptable to him. We will be the source of our salvation. We will be the source of everything. We will even be, be the determiners of what is good and evil. And we're still trying to do that. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him. She who abides in me and I in her. She it is that bears much fruit. He it is that bears much fruit. And in the chapter, the fruit is talking about the command to love as Jesus has loved us. And so that's the fruit he's talking about. But the only way for us to get that fruit in us 
To bear that fruit is for us to be connected into the vine, to get our branch reconnected into the life-giving uh, presence of the vine who is Jesus. That's the only way you can live, really live. Otherwise, you're living as a dead branch. Do you follow this? And the whole world is living as dead branches apart from Christ. He who abides in me and I in him, he does that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I've heard that this is hyperbole, that this is exaggeration, literary exaggeration. No, this is an exaggeration. It says in Colossians that in him all things hold together. In Jesus, all things hold together. So right now as you're sitting there, Jesus is holding your body and your life together. Without him, you don't exist. He's holding your life together. In him, all things were, through him, all things were created. He created you. He knows you more intimately than anyone. So this one who are, we are told in the Psalms, breathed out the stars, breathed out the galaxies, who created you yet while you were yet in your mother's womb, how much more does he know you than you know yourself? Right? But we always come back to it. Some of you are saying, but what must I do? Well, apart from me, you can do nothing. Does Jesus mean what he's saying here? Yeah. So, sin is an interesting term in, in the Bible. Uh, there's four words for sin in the Hebrew scriptures, and th the word for sin here is um, the first word used of, of sin in the Bible in, in Genesis 4, 7, where God tells Cain, who is contemplating murdering his brother, sin is crouching at your door. And this is the primary word for sin in the Old Testament. And it comes from a word, a, a verb, that means to miss the mark. It's an archery term. So the, the primary word for sin is to miss the mark. And normally we think of sin as missing the mark of keeping his rules, keeping the law. Adam and Eve didn't keep his one, one thing they told him not to do. They broke it and so they sinned. But there's a, a predecessor, a precursor to their sin that's really missing the mark. They were living in the love of God. They were living in his provision. They were living with him being the source of everything in their life. And all they had to do was live as creatures and worship him and, and enjoy each other's company. And so what mark did they miss? It wasn't so much breaking the rules. They chose to step out of the love of God. They chose to step out of living in that love So my father, one more, one more picture. This is my father three months before he died on his 70th birthday. Uh, when I was uh, 20 years old during the summer, I was up, up at the U. And I was dealing cocaine so I could support my habit. And I went on a cocaine run, a three-month cocaine run where I used cocaine every day. And... Um, as high as you go on cocaine, you go equally low into depression as the drug wears off. And ironically, cocaine is more expensive than gold by weight. It's more expensive than gold, but the high only lasts 10 minutes. So you have to continually use it to keep high. And the more you use it and the longer you use it, the more you go into a huge depression. So I got suicidal, suicidally depressed near the end of the summer and my friend Patty um, got me into Scientology to get me off of the cocaine. And they did get me off the cocaine, but then I found myself in something equally insidious as the drugs, this cult. And I didn't know where to turn. So I called my dad, who had been remarried to mom, who many of you know. They had gone back to Japan as missionaries, so I called him in Japan and said, I just blurted it out on the phone. Dad, I just spent $1,200 on cocaine, and I'm in Scientology. And I expected my dad just to blast me with his anger, to go into a rage and yell at me over the phone. He didn't do that at all. All he said was, Grant, I'll see you tomorrow at the airport. 
So the next day I, I drove out to the airport and my brother and sister met me there and he was coming through customs and it, he was severely delayed over an hour and I, the doors would open, I would see him in there and I would think, he's gonna lose his temper, he's gonna just, he had no qualms about making a scene in public as long as people didn't know him. So at an airport, no, no problem making a scene yelling at me. Well, you have to see this. Let's not trip here. He came through the doors and he saw me as a 112 pound skeleton. And he was carrying two big suitcases and he didn't say a word. He just set the suitcases down and he rushed over to me. And swept me into his arms. No words, no rage, no wrath, just grace. Just this unconditional love. It was my first taste of grace. It was my first experience of, of that kind of love. I, I didn't deserve his love at all. I had so abused them in terms of using their money. And my dad wasn't perfect. He never did get a hold of his anger. And I think it's because he thought it was up to him and he was failing. I don't know why. But our Father loves us so much, infinitely more than our earthly fathers. So much more that he gave Jesus. You understand that what we stepped out of in our deception was we stepped out of knowing that God is our everything. That he will provide our righteousness, that he will provide our peace, our joy. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, joy, patience, and so on. Not that we are righteousness of our own, but our righteousness com comes from God and so on. There's verse after verse that says the same thing, that it's all God. And our job is just to trust him. Our job is to trust him. I think of the love of God. He loved you so much that he sent his only son who willingly laid down on a cross and allowed his wrists and feet to be nailed to a, to a splintering wood. They then lifted the cross and dropped it into the hole. And you can hear some of his words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And at the end, therefore when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. He shouted out, it is finished, which was a Roman battle cry. When they knew the battle was won from the hilltop, they'd be surveying the battle and there would still be skirmishes, skirmishes left to fight. But the Roman general would shout out, it is finished, telling all those soldiers that they had won. Keep fighting, they had won. It also meant, means, the word means that the debt is paid in full. Our sin debt is paid in full. And a third meaning of this word, and I think it's John loves these uh, double and triple meanings. The third meaning is that the, f the full requirements of the law have been met in Jesus on our behalf. It is finished. In the last hours of a person's life on the cross, they could not lift their head. But this isn't just an ordinary person lying on the cross, hanging on the cross. He lifted his head, shouted, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. All because of love for you. Because we've been deceived thinking that I have to do something to earn his love. I have to dance the dance. I have to tap the tap dance. Has his love for you ever changed? Who's better able to create a righteousness which is acceptable to him? You or him? Him. Who is better able to to produce peace and joy and patience. I love it when people say, I gotta work on patience this week. I think, I always think, good luck with that. <laughs> you're gonna be out of patience before the day is done. In fact, you're probably gonna yell at your wife or your husband. 
king. We're so quick to jump back to what must I do? Instead of saying, what is God going to do? What has he done already? What is he going to do now? And what will he yet do? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves you. You know, immediately I think, well, how do I undeceive myself then? And that's the lie, speaking again, right? I can't undeceive myself. That's like asking Congress to clean up Congress. It doesn't work. <laughs> but we can ask God. Unearth any last vestiges of the lie in my life. Expose it to me and let me know how much you love us, how much you love me. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, just thank you. We all share this lie in, in common. We've, some of us more than others, but we have been deceived by it, Lord. And, and yet in your kindness, you showed us what you think of us by giving your son on the cross. So I pray that whatever lies, whatever vestiges of that lie still is in our life, unearth it and you replace it with the knowledge of who you are, with the knowledge of God. We exchange the lie for the truth of God. So you do that, Father, for us. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, for your continued work in our life. Thank you that we can trust you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.